everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It is me, and it is Nate. Nate, how are things? How's things going over there? On uh, it's it's nearly done with January. We're gonna be going in February. How February for me is always like the most depressing month. Um, just because like weather wise and and everything, it's just like fuck. You're you're still like got one more month of winter. What's uh what's it gonna be like there for you in England? I'm just excited that it's getting brighter because in December towards the solstice. We go through a period of time where the sun sets before four o'clock in the afternoon. Actual sunset is, and then like, you know, E E N T is probably like five, four thirty or five, and so it's just it's fucking miserable, man. Because like, yeah, the sun isn't properly up until what eight eight or so in the morning, and it's down before four, and you're just constantly in the dark. And so, I, even though the weather the weather is going to stay basically the same. We're not having a really particularly harsh winter, but the weather's going to stay basically the same probably until March. But like what you will notice, at least with the the, the movement forward uh, into the year, is just a little bit more daylight. Like it's already setting after four. I think it's like four fifteen or four twenty now. And there gets a point as you head towards the the equinox where like it actually starts to speed up. Like you get like five or so minutes of extra daylight every day. So that's nice. Like that, I actually look forward to that. But I reckon I remember Midwestern winters. And it's just, yeah, man, it's just fucking grim until like the end of March, isn't it? I mean, St. Louis may be a different, slightly different climate zone than than Indianapolis, but like yeah, I, I just remember it's been a, it's it been a fairly bad. mild it's been a mild winter. We've had we had snow a couple days ago, but none of it really stuck. Um, you know, I know that, and and for those of you not Midwesterners, you know, your winters can vary from year to year. Um, one year I remember having like massive blizzards like all all year. Um, last year we had a couple of days that were just like the the roads, like you literally could not do anything because the roads were so uh, sheet covered, but you know, just covered with ice. So it's been really mild. But I mean, me as as a person who just hates winter and hates cold weather and is not going outside uh, on a on a daily basis as is, it's just absolute hell. Like February is just that like that last like you got to drag your feet through it before you reach March and you can start. Like even March isn't necessarily like, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be warm all the time. Here you here you go. But at least it's like an opening, like green things start happening again. So um, my, my seasonal depression starts to, to move away from me. Meanwhile, fucking because of climate change and how mild this winter has been, um, on my cycle route, I've started to see trees with cherry blossoms. And it's like, it is way too early for cherry blossoms, but tree, nope. the trees are trees are fucking dumb though. Like, as soon as you have you know a week worth of like nice weather, you'll start seeing buds on anything, um, and then January will will fucking snap back, and then all of that shit will fall off, and then the trees is like, oh okay, like you can't go to a tree and be like, hey man, it's it's January. Wait, give it give it six weeks, and then you can start doing this. So. You know, you, you'll see that all the time. Anytime you have, like, especially in the Midwest, you know, the Midwest will always have, like, it always has this, like, fucked up winters, but there's always, like, that one day in January that's, like, inexplicably 65 degrees. Oh, yeah, when, yeah. Yeah, and then that that's when, like, all the plants are, like, your, your grass starts to, like, peak out a little bit. It's like, ooh, it's time, it's time, it's spring. You're just like, hey, y'all don't learn. I mean, people don't learn either. Um, every, every fucking year you hear people complain about how cold it is during the winter and how hot it is during the summer in the Midwest. Like guys, it's literally been here for 36 years. It's always fucking been like this. Stop trying to predict it. Um, climate change means nothing here. St. Louis, St. Louis is going to be the last place that you can grow a tomato. Um, after the world is ravaged, it's going to be me and my little raised bed chasing the fucking dog out and my little tiny thing of tomatoes. And that's it. It's the only tomatoes that are going to be in the world. And yes, I'm going to charge an exorbitant amount of money for them. God damn it. Yeah, man. I mean, I guess the thing for me is more that um, you come to realize that ultimately it's not even really the overall like peaks and troughs as much as it's just the general average. It does seem to me like they're, you know, in, in my parents' opinion, uh, them living in Southern Indiana, it's definitely getting hotter in the summer overall on average and definitely getting cold, getting more extreme in the winter, but like milder overall. But then you'll have these weird periods where, and you probably dealt with this too, where all of a sudden it's, you know, it's like November 1st and it's below zero or some shit. You have these weird freak outbursts or like you're describing that 72 and sunny day in January. So I don't know. I just, uh, it, 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 to me, wrapping up our dad weather chat, uh, I, I feel like the biggest thing is just 
people want to use localized experience to say, okay, climate change is real or is not real, but it's like uh, overall global trends are, it's real as hell. And uh, it's also getting so much worse in terms of just the overall amount of waste heat and you know CO2 being emitted. So I definitely don't know what it's going to lead to. I mean, there's a whole notion that if the ocean currents change, the jet stream that basically protects Europe from its actual latitude could change and we could suddenly start having you know, weather that would be more in line with what people in Canada at this latitude experience. But um, I hope not because Lord knows these houses are not built to handle serious cold weather. Uh, Does this mean you guys are going to have microclimates so it'll be fine? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Everybody's going to... Exactly. England is going to bounce back by becoming like the wine capital of the world and not because its wine is good. It's just because... England, the one thing that England is really good at is uh, being colonialists. So they're just going to be like, well, we make wine now. Now everybody buys our wine. If you don't, we're going to just absolutely destroy you. I mean, if you recall in the plot of Children of Men, Britain sucked, but it was the only place on the world that was more or less still functioning. Uh, So, you know, we could be heading that future. I mean, Children of Men is set in 2027. So I'm I'm, fingers crossed. We 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 meet our benchmarks. I was also going to say that the one thing that one thing that doesn't require a microclimate to be produced en mass is birthday cake, which is a relief <laughs> to Tom Cotton, the junior senator from Arkansas, because he knows that his breakfast food will not be affected by climate change whatsoever. Tom Cotton is just such a weird... So, Tom Cotton, if you uh, are, are new to the show, we've talked about Tom Cotton. Now that uh, Hunter, um, uh, Duncan Hunter is gone, uh, we have to find a new representative and unfortunately nobody is is, is as cartoonish as uh, Duncan Hunter uh, so all we have is Tom Cotton um, all we have is racism like Hunter was racist but like in a funny way like in a funny haha like I'm racist and also have five mistresses and buy plain seats for my rabbit kind of funny um, Tom Cotton is just absolutely racist as Islam Cotton is extremely dark Pete Buttigieg in every <laughs> way in every way Tom Cotton is like Tom Cotton is dark energy marathon runner Pete Buttigieg. He loves distance running and birthday cake. Um, he's uh, and keeping, he's and not keeping out, brown people out of the out. country. He's not out of the closet, but it's an open secret in Arkansas that he's gay, which shouldn't be a big deal at all. But obviously, in Republican politics, getting elected as a senator in Arkansas, I guess even with everyone knows you can't actually be open about it. Um, he's constantly. It's weird. It's weird to see him go in defensive mode and have to play the the like you know by d- defend Trump by saying that actually up is down and left is right because Tom Cotton has based his whole personality, his whole political demeanor around how dare you insult me? I am instead of being a future U.S. Army soldier, I'm a former U.S. Army officer. But it's the same vibe as that fucking dorky kid who may or may not have been my first sergeant's son saying. I'm a future U.S. Army soldier, except it's uh, in the past I was an army officer. I deployed to Iraq. I have a Ranger tab. Respect me, even though I'm a dorky ass dweeb, sh- you know, shilling for the most absurd reactionary politics. His his political viewpoints on Iran are basically to the right of John Bolton. His political viewpoints on immigration are, you know, completely simpatico with fucking Stephen Miller. He is one of the most odious and insane politicians in terms of his actual politics. Um, He's just also closeted slender man who loves birthday cake. And so it's it's absurd in a way. There's this bizarre just you know juxtaposition. Uh, but like it's in a way, he and Duncan Hunter have the same reactionary sentiments. But I think Tom Cotton has a lot more energy and focus, whereas Duncan Hunter was just a huge shit show all the time. And and Cotton is you know, he's he's a he's a veteran and he's actually like one of those he he declined going into the JAG Corps and decided to go infantry. Like, he really wanted to go kill some brown people. Um, should have gone enlisted, but he went uh, officer. He spent, he he did a deployment uh, planning and doing combat patrols and everything. I'm, I am I would be curious to, uh, to, to talk to anybody who served under, like, directly under Cotton, because he was a lieutenant when he was there. He so. was a platoon leader when he was deployed, yeah. So yeah, he, like, he, 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 he walked the walk in the sense. I mean, he did four years in the military, you know, as an infantry officer. Um, I don't think that he ever had any plans of making the military a career, and I don't think the military was anything besides a stepping stone for his political ambitions. And I suppose if you're 
Harvard and Harvard law grad from Arkansas who's a Republican, your your path is kind of set. And so in a, in a sense, this was just the military was finishing school for him in a way that doesn't get talked about. And I mean, I think that granted, I think he's just such a ghoul that people attack him for his ghoulishness. But there has been at least a frank conversation about Pete Buttigieg and the fact that the military was obviously like post Harvard McKinsey finishing school for him. Uh, it's the same thing with um with Tom, with Tom Cotton. It always has been. That's a very obvious thing. But once again, if you if you bring that up, then even us as veterans, even if we bring it up, then it's, you know, how dare you insult this brilliant scholar, blah, 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 blah. You love Obama, Obama law school, blah, 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 the same shit over and over again. It's all this dissembling because when right wing assholes go into the military to burnish their credentials so they can then become nightmare warmonger politicians and quite frankly, incredibly powerful politicians. I mean, being a senator in the United States is massive. Um, it's OK. But if someone in the left joins the military not even the left, someone in the liberal center joins the military in any capacity, and then that gets referenced in any capacity in their political ambitions. They are careerists, John Kerry, et cetera, et cetera, the same thing over and over again. Um, once again, it's it's no secret that it's it's incredibly hypocritical and mendacious, but we just watch this happen over and over again. And I think the thing with, with Cotton is always so hilarious is that how he never gets called on it ever by anyone. I, I, I'm noticing here as well, just looking at his Wikipedia, that he demanded that some New York Times journalists get uh, put in jail for espionage for publishing an article detailing a Bush administration secret program monitoring terrorist finances. He asserted that the newspaper had gravely endangered the lives of my soldiers and all the other soldiers and innocent Iraqis here, which I... It's finances, y'all. Chill, well, chill out. you fucking guys, you need <laughs> to York go Times, to jail. The Times, like... The, he wrote an open letter to the Times, and the Times apparently didn't publish it. But some uh, conservative blog called Powerline. Uh, oh yeah, it, which <laughs> which sounds- someday we should have a we should have a review of all the stupid conservative blog names from the two thousands because they were they were so incredible. It's like you know you. You, you, dumb shit that wouldn't make it into the news because it was so obviously it was too bad faith for even major media in the United States. Um, you know, gets published on like Mr. Night Train or something like that, and all of a sudden it becomes this big talking point on the Drudge Report or whatever the fuck, and then it makes it into Fox News or uh, once it got established, the Blaze and so on and so forth. And yeah, exactly. Um, I'm just gonna say that I am not a fan of a conservative blog being called Powerline because in the 1995 movie, a goofy movie, goofy Power, movie, Powerline, I know Powerline is the fucking musician. He's yeah, the badass. Yeah, he's he and he's the the everybody loves him. Uh, he's kind of like a little Michael Jackson, a little bit of, uh, you know, you can, fuck, I'm so mad that I, I see Powerline um, because Goofy, there's other Goofy movies and Powerline t-shirts are out there and I keep, I'm mad Isn't, that uh, Powerline was voiced by Tevin Campbell, wasn't he? At least the I songs so. were, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, ah, a Goofy movie whipped ass. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, uh, didn't Max get like threatened with the death penalty for basically like a really stupid infraction? Probably. Well, he, he, um, he impersonated power line at one point i just remember there being a thing that he was facing going to prison and like he was facing the death penalty and it's like it's such a bizarre send-up of american justice but also could be real yeah uh so heavy endorsement for the the goofy movie uh by by the podcast a very you know what there's not a lot of movies out there that explore you know uh a father having to deal with uh his son growing up and you know growing away and uh, Goofy Movie really touches on that. So um, you should watch that. It's great, and it's a little sad. Anyway, Tom Cotton. Back to back to Tom Cotton. So the reason we're bringing Tom Cotton up is because he is back in the news uh, kissing Donald Trump's ass. Um, recently, Trump discussed uh, the... So if we go back in time a little bit, I know that it's been you know more than uh, 72 hours, so it's hard to remember back to a different news cycle. But back when we were still about to go to war with Iran, um, and Iran flung a bunch of uh, missiles at an Iraqi uh, base, uh, didn't kill anybody, but it turns out it injured about 34 uh, soldiers, uh, American soldiers. Couldn't tell tell you about Iraqis. We don't we don't we don't count them. Um, but they uh, they got TBIs. Um, you know, so the 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 missiles they come in, they hit the ground, they explode. You get a lot of um, uh, you know pressure and concussive waves that come with those, and that's where you can get problems with. Uh, you know the the uh, uh, a traumatic brain injury, um, and basically what it is, it rattles your brain around inside of your head. It's like getting a concussion. So, uh, you know, we 
originally it was no injuries, and then it's like, oh, 12 people had to be evacuated for TBIs, and then now we're up to 34 people. Now, again, we on the podcast do not endorse any reason to go into a stupid war with any any country for any reason. Um, so this is not a call to, to, to arms to be like, they, they injured our people, we need to go back and do something. Um, but it is a way... It, once again, you have our our wet brain president who is out here saying, you know, well, they just got headaches. Um, they they they're not. It's not as bad as losing an arm or a leg or anything like that. Um, and I mean, yes, Nate, yes, that's true. Um, however, it's just not. It's just not something you say. Like really, honestly, and and then you have Tom Cotton who is literally a veteran. Who is out here, you know, standing for 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 Donald Trump, saying like, you know, it, you know, because a lot of people, especially the VFW, just came out and was just like, no, you you can't say shit like that. You need to apologize for it. And you've got Tom Cotton, who is a veteran, who who led soldiers overseas, um, and and he's telling people that uh, it's not. Let me pull up the quote here. Um, he said uh, earlier this week, the uh, Trump said that uh, the troops had headaches and a couple of other things as a result of the attack. But I would say, and uh, and I can report, it's not very serious. Um, and you know, the the dismissing that that Tom Cotton did. If there are in fact all of these injuries are not serious. If they're on the less serious side of the scale than severe traumatic uh, side of the scale, the president is just describing what happened, and I'm not dismissing them. And just just shut the fuck up, you know. Just shut the fuck up. How about that? Can we can we can we have a, a a Republican senator just shut the fuck up for once? I swear to God, Nate. Every time, every time a stupid fucking president says something, and a stupid fucking conservative or Republican senator has to go up, and you know because they've all fucking bent the knee and they're all doing this, you know, trash can man from the stand, my life for you bullshit. They always have to say, just shut the fuck up. Like, it doesn't require this. You could just say, like, yeah, it's, you know, that is pretty, that is pretty sad uh, that, that this happened and that the, the president, but you can't, they, they, they always just have to do this shit. And I'm just really getting fucking tired of it. Um, and I and mean, I, the thing for me is this, when I look at somebody like Tom Cotton, that this isn't an issue where he's really going to lose any political capital even amongst bloodthirsty insane nightmare republicans you know the kind of people who for whom trump is like a religious totem he by saying i disagree with the president i think you know military casualties downrange even if they're classified as minor aren't anything to make light of you know these people are in harm's way etc he could say that and it wouldn't be so bootlicky and weird and I think that's the thing that, that always makes me laugh is that there are all of these, what you would describe as kind of sacred objects in, in American politics, these, these things you cannot say and do. Uh, for example, insult the troops. And Donald Trump does it all the time and he pays zero price for it because if it comes down to you know supporting Trump, even if he's doing the things that they would crucify somebody else for, certainly crucify a Democrat or a non-Republican for, or um, actually opposing him. Like, it, 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 it creates this, I don't know, it's like they would have a complete epistemic collapse if they had to be like, I'm mad at Donald Trump, you know? <laughs> like, it's just not possible. And so I don't necessarily know if Cotton thinks that this is required of him because of he wants to get reelected in the state of Arkansas, or if he actually believes this. But it's just hilarious to me because i mean i got a brain injury or a head injury rather when i was deployed and it wasn't really all that serious it was serious enough that i had to go to the aid station get stitches i had to get medicine for it i had pretty bad headaches for a while afterward and some of that was probably just stress with the end of the deployment too but like i had periodic really bad headaches and they've gone away mostly like i don't really have a problem with it anymore and when i got it checked out by um at the va it wasn't it wasn't classified i mean i i had post concussion syndrome on my um on my medical records but it wasn't anything to worry about in the sense that like it wasn't it didn't meet the standard of like diminishing your cognitive functions tbi but it was still fucking bad i mean like i got hurt it sucked and i think about 
when you're talking about the kind of overpressure from you know surface to surface rockets launched from a fucking different country i don't know if those are like comparable to the big like 250 millimeter katyushas but big ass rockets like that cause so much concussion that it's entirely possible that people are going to have serious life altering effects you know diminishing their quality of life from this even if it doesn't count as uh, you know, the kind of thing that's going to make headlines because people didn't die or people weren't, weren't, weren't mortally wounded or, you know, disfigured. But I mean, in a country where there's a naval yard shooting and lawmakers are like, oh, all of the people who got shot in this, in this mass shooting in America deserve the Purple Heart. The idea that you would then turn around and say, this doesn't really count. I mean, yeah, yeah. Donald Trump may have called them whiny ass babies who poo themselves, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, ultimately, they are kind of whiny babies, aren't they? Like, it's such an absurd thing. And, and these people have to twist themselves into pretzels to defend the stuff that he says when he's just, you know, belting out whatever comes to his mind when he's, you know, shitting on his golden throne. It, it's, it's hilarious, but it's also really sad because I don't, I think... If this fostered an understanding among people who seem to think that if you're a veteran, if you're in the military, that you're somehow your existence and your livelihood and your well-being are above politics, um, obviously that's dumb and that no one should believe that ever. But a lot of people do and did, especially in the in the kind of Obama era repurposing of Bush era pro-military aggressive patriotism kind of stuff, which I think is a really important thing to bear mention. Uh, that if you look at the way that Obama and the Democratic Party attended to the military and the war and veterans and so on and so forth, there was really this massive uh, kind of adoption of we also love the troops, we love the troops harder, we love the troops so much that we make the Republicans look bad because Republicans don't love the troops enough. That kind of stuff did in my opinion, foster this idea that veterans and military are above politics. And I wish that upon seeing some of just the craven, stupid, idiotic shit that Donald Trump and his people say and do, this would foster a realization among people, you know, whose family are in the military, who are veterans themselves, or who are in the military. Like these people don't give a fuck about you. They never have, they never will. What they say, you know, and their their various sort of platitudes don't actually translate ever to any kind of thing that's going to mean something for you in your life. But I just don't know if that's going to happen because, I mean, Donald Trump's job is to own the libs. And as long as he's owning the libs, these people are okay. If he literally shits on them, ruins their livelihood, burns their house down, doesn't matter. They're, they see him as a guy who's pissing off people they don't like. And as such, they can't help but support him even if he is saying and doing things that diminish them and make light of their concerns yep and and this is you know it, it all started it just it reminds me of going back to the Khan family you know when when trump was insulting gold star families and and i don't i feel like there is i don't know maybe just the people that i talk to there is some kind of uh i don't want to say it turning against donald trump but like certainly people who are like i don't know eh, this guy is kind of an asshole um the last time that I was talking to, like I was on any kind of active duty talking to soldiers that weren't just a bunch of reservists was about two years ago. And, you know, it, it, most of the conversation revolved around like, ah, uh, he's letting us take the gloves off in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was this idea of like, now we can win. And I, I'm really curious now that we're still not winning, um, we're still losing and we're still kind of tucking tail when, when these things happen. Not that I don't think we should tuck tail and get the fuck out of there. Um, we, we've obviously uh, overstayed our welcome and uh, are not going to win these, these you know, conflicts. But I'm very curious as to where, like when something like this happens, like, I mean, I know people who have gotten TBIs. Fucking, you know, it's... It's not uncommon to have a TBI. People get their bells rung inside of tanks and uh, inside of uh, MRAPs and all kinds of stuff all the time. And like, it's hard to have like a uh, an injury like that because it's not it's not visible. You know, it's uh, you you get you know blown up and you get your head knocked up against the side of the interior of a of a Humvee, and then suddenly you can't remember birthdays anymore. Um, I mean, like people that my 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 buddy served with, you know were killed by overpressure from IED blasts. You know, people, um, he had an NCO, one of my good friends had an NCO who went through so many um, IED explosions in Afghanistan 
that he was discharged with 100% disability. And he was fine. He was like head in the game, super good at doing his job, like and absolutely was still lucid and didn't have a problem with memory loss. But he couldn't stop pissing himself when he was you know, on missions. And it was completely involuntary. It wasn't a fear thing. He was absolutely like, hell yeah, let's do this. Like I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm here for the whole ride. But it was an involuntary reaction. And that was because of his brain getting fucking scrambled by, uh, by getting blown up so many times. And I mean, I know that's anecdotal and obviously it's secondhand, but I think about that. Those are some of the consequences. I mean, I think of people that I know that like, you know, you have things, periods of depression, mood swings, weight gain or weight loss, like uh, incredible changes in their personality and their ability to make way in the world because of brain injuries. And some of those are from combat. Some of those are from getting blown up. Some of those are from, you know, being in a vehicle when it gets blown up and getting banged around, like you said. Some of it's from overpressure. Some of it's from um, training accidents, you know, getting in wrecks uh, while training or just being a paratrooper because you're constantly banging your fucking head against the ground when you land, you know, stuff like that. And on a long enough timeline, it, it creates serious problems for people. And so it's one of these weird things where... I don't want there to be this massive politicization of these soldiers who were wounded because I don't want that to become like the, you know, Evangelist Satania, remember the main kind of shit when they use it as uh, a, a causes belly for trying to trying to intensify tensions with Iran, you know, trying to increase the likelihood of a head on confrontation. I don't want this to be, you know, their justification for that. But I also think that this is just another slice of evidence in the overall fucking pie that proves that, that Donald Trump doesn't give a shit about anything at all, whether it's the military, the troops, the wars, et cetera, anything related to defense, anything related to America. He just doesn't care. He says the first thing that comes to mind, we legitimately elected our Facebook uncle president. And as such, it shouldn't surprise you that there are no uh, red lines, you know, things that he won't cross. And no one's going to hold him accountable for it. If they were going to hold him accountable, they would have held him accountable when he made fun of the disabled uh, journalist, you know, by, by mocking his, uh, uh, like his physical disability, when he made fun of John McCain for being a prisoner of war, when he made fun of the Khan family, when he made all of these things. It doesn't matter. That was 2015, 2016. Like none of it fucking mattered. None of it stopped him. People don't care. Uh, they want basically senile grandpa to own the libs. And so I do think to some extent, it's funny to watch how nobody who works with him ever comes out of it on top. Nobody's career winds up getting advanced. Eventually, you get slimed. And I think if the VFW, I wasn't aware of this. You, you brought this up. If the VFW is, is cr criticizing Trump, um, it's interesting to imagine what kind of schism that might form, considering that most veterans, I mean, just statistically speaking, most veterans are older. Like when you look at the 22 suicides a day statistic, most of those are men over the age of 55. A significant number of veterans, a large, if I'm not mistaken, the, the majority of veterans are older and they're white dudes mostly. And as such, even without military service, they're likely to be Trump supporters. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of schism forms. To me, the only thing that I've seen that really has made people that I've seen in my own personal experience, and I've talked about this before on the show, was them basically just handing over the, the Rajava to the, the Turks. Um, a lot of people that I know who worked in Syria and northern Iraq with the Kurds were just like, I, I'm embarrassed to have worn the uniform, which was crazy to see, to see people like that, you know, folks who had spent their entire military careers being more or less apolitical, but certainly not critical of Trump at all be like, I'm, ash I'm ashamed to be an American. That, that was a surprising moment. And so who knows? Maybe, maybe this will foster some change. I don't know. Um, it's, it's very difficult to convince people that there's more to a political leader than someone who's just going to howl at the moon and do racism all day. But I mean, that's the country we live in. Well, and, and I think that we are coming to that head, I believe. Um, there, there's always going to be that that huge percentage of uh, conservatives who are going to vote for Donald Trump no matter what, and uh, they're going to tell me that um, me having an anti-fascist uh, AVI means that I'm the real fascist, and that they're going to shoot me in Portland as if I'm going to Portland all of a sudden. <laughs> that was mine yesterday. Some some guy with uh, with a QAnon picture um, and. Uh, uh, 17 followers telling me that he's going to murder me in Portland. I'm like, cool. All right. I guess, um, you, you're always going to have those, but I do feel like, I don't know. I, 
I feel like there there's plenty of like when when Sanders gets the nomination, um, because at this point, like he is he is fucking curb stomping everybody so hard that uh he's I mean, I don't know I don't know if you've seen the latest Iowa polls. Um we're recording this on Monday, but Warren is uh polling behind uh Klo- Klobuchar at this point uh the fucking midwest mom eating a salad with a f- with a comb is beating warren at this point so that's that's incredible um but you're probably going to have people who say oh god it's bernie i have to i have to vote for for trump um because i'm afraid of communism but i feel like there's probably going to be a lot of people who much like in 2016 saw hillary clinton on the ballot and said no nah, i just can't uh who are going to look at trump on the ballot and say no nah, i just can't um so I don't know. Maybe I, I, I mean, I want Bernie to win. Obviously, um, I would prefer anybody over Trump. But I, I do find it funny that uh, there are ways in which the operation against Bernie is comparable to the operation against Corbyn, and it hasn't really succeeded in the way that it did against Corbyn. And obviously, with Corbyn, it didn't at first, and then subsequently, it did. I don't know what's going to be like with Bernie, but I would say. From my experience watching it in the U.S., I would expect a lot of uh, a lot of weird news organizations that seem incredibly anti-Bernie, like strange blogs popping up that suddenly are everywhere, to just emerge out of the woodwork uh, because that's that's all dark money shit, you know. With with if you if you think about there was a, there was a, a a comment getting shared um, from a New York Times article. Uh, by somebody had said, you know, as a gay man, my life is no demonstrably different under Trump than it was under Obama. But if Sanders or Warren win, then I'm going to be forced out of my investment banking job and have to be a job government bureaucrat. No, thanks. I'll take Trump. <laughs> and I was just like, who oh boy. Well, um, not to put too fine a point on it, but there you have it. And so I do think that if I, I think I think Bernie will win Iowa based on this polling, we'll see. Um, how he performs in the South really depends. I mean, he's he's apparently increased his favorability among Black voters quite a bit in the South, or just in general. But but that's going to be a huge deal in places like South Carolina. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to make any predictions right away. I personally thought that you were going to see a 2017 style poll reversal in the United Kingdom general election in December. That obviously did not wind up happening. Um, but. I hope that Sanders wins. And I also tell everyone listening to this, um, and if this is the only leftist politics podcast you listen to, then cool, that's that's badass. There are lots of others, so I appreciate you choosing us. But just take it from me, don't be surprised when all of a sudden people that you thought were more or less like boilerplate news people turn into like North Korean fucking news when it comes to denouncing Bernie Sanders. It will get so weird that you won't believe your own eyes that the shit is happening. That is that was my experience here. I will go to my grave completely stunned by the stuff that I saw, you know, establishment media do to ensure there was no possibility of Corbin winning. And I expect that they're gonna try the same thing with Bernie. I also think that Bernie's appeal to the people he has to win, both in the primary and the general, um, to my eyes, poses fewer possibilities for um, the smearing to like actually land, but who even knows? Because as you're seeing with the thing with the the um, endorsement from Joe Rogan, they will try to make hay out of, out of anything, and they'll just never shut the fuck up about it. So, will this actually translate into it r- reducing Bernie's chances in the polls? I don't know, and I think one of the reasons why it's hard to say is that more than anything else, this is th- the United States is a huge country. And it's a lot less, we maybe describe as unipolar in the sense that there is not necessarily like a huge multiplicity of sources of people to draw from to get their news, et cetera. But it's not like, I mean, in Britain, basically everybody knows everybody. Everybody goes to dinner parties with everybody. Everybody in establishment media all went to the same private schools and the same private universities. Like it's it's such an inc- incredible opportunity for them to close ranks. It's going to be a little harder for that to happen in America. So fingers crossed that Bernie's going to do it. We're going to find out. But uh, that also brings us to another person that I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, Elizabeth Warren is pulling neck and neck with, which is Pete fucking Buttigieg. God. Mayor Pete, Rat man. face bread thief. <laughs> So we we did a we did a takedown on Mayor Pete a long time ago um, when when he first started to to show any kind of promise in the polls. Um, Mayor Pete, the thirty seven year old uh, bread fixing um, 
Canada Guy who joined Navy intelligence, mayor Navy intelligence. Yeah, mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> Pete Buttigieg won his mayoral race by fewer votes, uh, with fewer numbers of votes overall than even I think Alexandria Ocasio Cortez won her primary in New York, where it's a closed primary and the turnout was like 11 percent. So the idea that he has some mass appeal is entirely a media confection. He's what your great silent generation and or boomer grandparents wish their millennial and Gen Z kids would be like. They want them to be fresh faced Harvard graduate McKinsey Navy veterans, but no one actually fucking cares. Mayor Pete is like when when people tell you that they're okay with, you know, gay marriage and people being homosexual, what they're thinking of is Mayor Pete. Um, which is, as you said, a fresh faced uh, white boy who is somewhat um, somewhat Republican. Like, let's be honest, he's a bit he's a bit more conservative. He's than basically else. Republican. He's he's a 90s Republican, except you couldn't be gay in the 90s Republican world or basically in the Democratic Party back then. Right. And as such, he um, he if, if America were more sane and if the Republican Party understood that it had the ability to win the votes of conservative white gays and lots of conservative non-white people if they just weren't so insanely homophobic and transphobic and racist uh in a in a in a in a more sane republican party pete Buttigieg would absolutely be the person that they were trying to put forward uh which makes me laugh because you know he we i've heard it said before that that they are trying to sell pete Buttigieg as gay obama and it's just like i don't think a that misunderstands Obama's appeal, but B, I also think that he, this is just the wrong moment for it. Like o- Obama, as the salve to heal the wounds of Bush, had a lot of promise in 2008, and in 2016 we saw how not effective that had been. So, to me at least, when I look at this stuff happening, I'm just like, how in the fuck did any of you think that this? was the vessel for your shitty politics. Fucking Pete Buttigieg, really. And like you I, think like I've been saying, man, the thing that freaks me out the most about Pete Buttigieg right now is not that I think he's going to become president, it's that he's 37 years old and now everybody knows who he is. And he's a shitty politician. He's a sh- he's got a shitty past. Like how are you 37 and your past is already this fucked? Like we're we're watching we're watching a Joe Biden in the making at this point, you know we're watching. But like in the seventies, it was easier to get away with being like, yeah, we shouldn't be desegregating schools, and yeah, we should be building more prisons and be a Democrat. You could get away with that shit a lot easier. We're just watching Pete Buttigieg do that in real time, and it's and it's insane because there's going to be like, I, I, when's he going to switch? Like, when's he going to switch over to Republican Party? Um, I and mean, that's something that I think is is really important to bear in mind. Is if if Sanders does win the nomination, and you know, knock on every piece of fucking wood that I own, he, uh, which is a lot, I, I I have way too much wood furniture. Uh, he wins the general. I do think that you're going to see some fuckery like that, and it wouldn't surprise me if there is a, a, a like a a desire to split. People are going to try to foment a split from the Democratic Party. And it's going to be people like Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg or any one of these rat faced freaks that they've brought up with just like this just zero value politics over the last generation, basically in the sort of the detritus of fucking Clintonism. Well, you, you already kind of have that with the with the third wayers. Um and God bless the third way Twitter account, which uh, every time it tweets just gets fucking owned into the ground by literally everybody, because they're they're just if you're if you're unaware of who the third who third way is, they're the ones who are uh, like, ah, oh, well, we're not conservatives and we're not you know you crazy loony lefties who love communism and want to kiss Stalin. We're the ones who think that you know social security maybe can survive a couple of cuts and maybe you know uh, I do want a yacht and you shouldn't tell me I shouldn't have one. Um, One of them, my my favorite recent pieces, and I'll see if I can find it and I can link to it in the show notes here because I really do think it bears reading. I want to say it was the New Republic, but it was basically a journalist followed third way members, you know, like their leadership on what would be described as like a nationwide listening tour to go to these events and meet people. And the journalist then read the report that third way generated based on their findings. And it had nothing to do with any of the things people told them. They're like, people want strong defense, but they don't want 
far left policies like Medicare for all when people are just like, stop the wars and give us fucking health care. Like everybody, <laughs> this, they were like, whether it was extreme right wing fucking, you know, Nazi shit or whether it was like, like people who want Medicare for all people who don't want the entirety of the US economy to be oriented around, you know, a nightmare defense budget. Whatever it was, Third Way then just spun it into saying they want strong defense and they want to secure our borders and they don't want failed policies on leftist healthcare from the seventies. Like it was, it was insane. Like they just reality means nothing to these people. It absolutely means nothing to these people. Like they, that all of, when well, you think it, about like the Tom Stairs and the fucking Howard Schultzes and all of these, the Mike Bloomberg's, all of these people. Like the the reason why they keep running on this shit. It's because no one will ever tell them they're wrong and they have all the money that you could, like, they have more money than fucking God. And then the only thing that ever forces them into contact with reality is when they try to win office and people are like, no, we don't want that. Right. I, I wasn't it Bloomberg who said that uh, if Sanders got the nomination, he was going to run as a third party. And it's like, dude, you're not even polling well enough to like, you're, you're polling like to where you, the margin of error might be that people are anti-voting against you. Like there might, <laughs> there might, you might have fewer votes than there is a population because of, of our margin of error. And maybe if Bloomberg won, there'd be people who's like, well, I can, you know, throw my vote away. But like, then look, then, then we get to, uh, we get to throw it into the faces of all the, uh, the dipshit, uh, Democrats who kept telling us that, you know, we got to vote blue no matter who. Um, I don't know. Like, so anyway, to get back to Mayor Pete, why we have Mayor Pete on here. Um, speaking of our our you know our, our troopy troops who are running for president, Mayor Pete's the only one in the top four who's who has any military experience, and uh, he says that military service is a valuable asset in the White House. Now, I want to I want to read this this paragraph to you describing Mayor Pete's time in, um, in the military. Uh, Buttigieg, a naval intelligence officer in Afghanistan in 2014, noted he had been present for rocket attacks while stationed at Bagram Airfield and later faced potential danger as an armed driver in Kabul. Uh, another what? president... <laughs> Nate, he, he's faced the if same danger. If you're letting a fucking Navy lieutenant drive around in Kabul by himself or as a driver, you need your head checked. You, your, your chain of command needs to be fucking notified. What are you doing? No, what, no. I, how get, is, I get this. He was probably, you know, driving from the compound to, you know, meetings and whatnot in maybe Biop or, or the Green Zones or whatever. Um, at one point in time, I was Biop, an arm- He was driving from Afghanistan yeah, to fucking to Iraq. Biop. Yeah. No, so so um, from uh, the, uh, you know, just... Kabul, Kabul's the, the the capital city in in Afghanistan. So, and I know that when I was there in 2014, the Kabul base was really really tiny. Um, but they always had to leave, go out into the city to go to various meetings with. Uh, Legitimately, with if you wanted to go from Camp Eggers to Camp Phoenix, you have to drive out into the city because even though they're on di- they're on different sides of the same airfield, but you can't cross the runway, so you have to go out into the Kabul city and then right. come back around. And I mean, every yes, an armed driver. Yes, you were a soldier or you were a na- a, a seaman with a with a rifle. Yes, you were an armed driver. And like, I don't want to again. We, I'm I'm pogue as fuck, so I'm not trying to sit here and be like, ha ha, I have you know more combat experience than you. But also, I'm not trying to be like, man, I was I was on Bagram when when rockets you know were shot at the airfield, fucking half a click away from me. And I mean, I was in Paktika and I went on patrols and air assaults, and I feel bad talking about this shit because I didn't do it as much as you know some of the guys in like the line companies because I was in headquarters company. I mean, I lived on an Afghan base and got fucking mortared and rocketed all the time, but like. Yeah, but I was also in the provincial capital. It wasn't anywhere near as hot there as it was in some of the other areas of our province. And like and our province wasn't even the worst in the in the the regional command, much less the country at the time. So the idea of, of just ugh, it just weirds me the fuck out, man. Yeah, this is very real for me. Buttigieg told uh interviewed David Yepsen. And I do believe there's a value to in someone in the Oval Office understanding what's at stake, understanding at a personal level what's at stake when decisions are made that could send people into conflict. Uh, the perspective that perspective is needed, especially when we've got a president who thinks the strength is the same as chest thumping of a loudmouth guy at the end of the bar. Um, I, again, like I don't, I, I look, military experiences mean shit. Like 
I know plenty of people who have done multiple deployments, and all they did was, you know, were, were licking windows in the back of a Humvee or jerking off in guard towers. That doesn't make you a fucking presidential candidate. Buttigieg, I mean, I'm- is it useful to have perspective? Sure, but there's perspective can come from a variety of places, and I, I'm not so hung up on the idea that m- military service gives you an advantage over certain other things that I think that you should discount all of Pete Buttigieg's obvious shortcomings and say, oh, well, well, I'm a veteran. It's like, I don't know. I mean, his Christopher job, Dorner was a veteran. His job was, it says here, Buttigieg, who is tasked with reading and interpreting intelligence on the flow of money to terrorist cells. I mean, look, if, if we're going to talk about fighting terrorists, that is a very important job um, to, to track the financing, where the money is coming from, where is it going, what's it being used for. Absolutely. That is an important job in in the fight against terrorism. Um, it certainly does not mean that you should be a fucking president. I mean, come on. You 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 read you read intelligence reports. You interpreted them, you sent them up to somebody else, and then somebody went in somebody else went in and kicked in doors. Let's pump the brakes on on these things. Like let's also not overestimate what a junior officer does and has access to and has decision making authority over. I'm saying this as someone who was also an O3. I didn't deploy as an O3. I deployed as an O2, but then I promoted later and I did what would be described as an operational deployment, but not a combat deployment to Central America. And I mean, you just come on. You like don't 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 blow smoke up people's asses. Like you don't. This isn't. You're not some some high level fucking spy master. You you're. You're a junior officer. You probably worked on a fucking joint staff. You weren't even in a leadership position on that staff. You probably. I don't know. It's that sounds like he was in the J two or something like that. Cool. I mean, good on you. you. Deploy whatever. But like, fuck's sake, man. Don't make this into. Don't church this up into something that it's not. Because that's when folks like you and me start looking into it and being like, uh, yeah. This, yeah. this is like this is like 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 me me trying to sell myself as some kind of like wilderness expert because like I did orienteering a bunch. It's like <laughs> yes, I'm good at land nav. Like I'm not a wilderness expert. Like please don't rely on me to survive. Yeah, I mean, come on. Tom Cotton has more of an argument here than 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 Pete Buttigieg does. Um, just Tom Cotton. I, mean, I would is, trust. Is I would trust Tom racist. Cotton's advice on how to maintain warrior fitness while eating like shit. Uh, and so, as a result, I think you know, I would actually. There are some things Tom Cotton could say that I'd be like, yeah, that that that. I mean, he's he's right about how to you know decrease your marathon time. He's a horrible piece of shit otherwise. In the same vein that like if Pete Buttigieg wants to give me advice on how to fix the prices of bread in Canadian grocery stores, <laughs> I'm all ears because that's a valuable skill set. He has mastered capitalism in that regard. But does that mean that he's a worthwhile political candidate? No. And does his military service really provide that much of an advantage? Also no. Yeah. Fuck him. Uh, as always, fuck, uh, fuck Mayor Pete. And uh, goddamn, if he... I f- I feel like he's going to maybe maybe hopefully he's going to go away and he'll just get a consulting job somewhere. He'll be like the guy who it's just like he ran for president. He came so close. He came so close. Would you like to come fix bread prices uh here in South America? Uh and probably yes, he will. He'll go back to like his his default is just, you know, being a shitty consultant and figuring out ways to like look at things and be like Man, these these executives really want to make more money. How can we do that? Like, who who can we fire so that the money can flow in a different direction, mostly to stockholders? Like, that's what Pete Buttigieg is really good at. I mean, his Medicare for all who wanted is like one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever seen. Some really like consultant level McKinsey consulting bullshit. Like, admit. Uh, do do you want to buy into uh into this thing? A thing that nobody's asking for. Who wants to buy into Medicare? How about we just all have it? Like, no, no, we can't we can't all have it. We can't, you know, cut uh cut taxes to anybody. Uh we can't, you know, sell less helicopters and private jets to to billionaires. But, you know, if you the the person uh really want to take your Obamacare and make it slightly better, while costing a little bit more than it already does, man, have I got a fucking democratic candidate for you. Um, so again, fuck them. Um, 
vote for vote Sanders, please. Jesus fucking Christ. Yes, just vote, vote Sanders. Come on. Like I, I'm registered to vote uh, in New York State. I'm voting uh, absentee. I'm voting in the primary. I'm voting for Sanders. I don't necessarily know if Sanders has a chance to win in New York because New York is bad. But I still think Against it's worth who? doing. Like who's gonna? Like, do you think Biden would beat him out in New York? Yeah, either Biden or Warren, to be honest with you. Mm. And there'll be a, there'll be a strong Manhattan Pete Buttigieg vote too. I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, New York, New York has a closed primary. It's better now. They've since they've kind of put the screws to Andrew Cuomo. They've had to do things like uh, same day voter registration and um, and early voting and things like that. So I think it's better than it was in 2016 for sure. Um, it's it, it was it was God, it was bad in 2016 though. Believe me. Um, so we'll see. But I mean, I'm just saying, vote vote. Vote for Sanders, please. Vote Bernie. Bernie's good, uh, and Bernie has strong, in my opinion, has the strongest chance of beating Trump. Don't look at Trump and be like, "Oh, this is a done deal. He's going to lose." Like, folks, I'm just telling you, prepare yourself for the worst possible outcome. Think about how you can organize to defeat it, but never get high on your own supply and think we've got this in the bag. Because I'm just going to tell you, uh, I saw what happened here in the United Kingdom. We had an unabashed leftist candidate. They monstered him so bad he had like record unfavorability, and he lost to a a birthday cake eating idiot who doesn't run marathons. So I don't know if you know this, but Boris Johnson eats birthday cake every day too for some reason. Birthday cake's good. All right, don't let's let's not let's let's not denigrate a good cake just uh, just because dumb racists like it. Very true. Okay, birthday cake is good. Um, I also um, there's part of me that had this horrible vision of what if somebody made birthday cake flavored vape juice. It's just like. Dude, God, I've uh, absolutely. Heaven, I'm, sure I'm sure it exists. I'm sure it exists. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> and now I gotta go. Now I gotta go buy it. Exactly, exactly. Because I mean, you can't be a podcaster if you don't vape. So I mean, there you have it. <laughs> um. So Francis, you did a video for our bonus this week about propaganda. Could you maybe talk about it, and we'll, we'll play some of it. Absolutely. So um, it's it's a fairly short. It's you know twenty minutes or so. Um, if uh if if you're not familiar with me on Twitter, my my handle has always been American Propagandist. Uh, and it is, you know, as public affairs is, is kind of what I do. So I've been doing a lot more reading, uh, and, and just looking into propaganda and I've been, you know, doing a bit of a writing series on our website, hell of a way to die, uh, com as well. Uh, so, so check the, check those out. Um, this, uh, this video and, you know, if you want, if you don't want to watch a YouTube video, the, uh, the audio is attached to it as well. You can go download the audio, uh, but it's basically me talking about a book that was written in 1928 um, by a propagandist. But uh, the Bernays, uh, the, the the man who wrote it, you know, it's 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 PR basically uh, what propaganda is and how we have a negative connotation to it and how propaganda really is just anything being sold to anybody. So uh, go take a look. I'm going to be doing more writings and probably more conversations about propaganda. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if you're interested in that, uh, it's available to everybody, uh, every Patreon level dollar and up. Um, if, uh, and if you have, you know, questions, you want to discuss more about it, you can always comment on, uh, the, uh, 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 on the Patreon post, or you can DM me, uh, at army Strang. Uh, you can email us at, uh, Sergeant Joker at hell of a way to die. Com. I'm hoping to do a lot more about this because, uh, propaganda is incredibly interesting to me. Um, not just wartime propaganda, but like, you know, propaganda, you know, positive and negative. Um, propaganda is a, um, it's, uh, it's a land of contrasts. Uh, it's a, a term of contrast, I guess. Um, it's neither good nor bad, but we all consider it as a bad thing. So I guess my, I'm not trying to rehabilitate the word propaganda. I'm just trying to understand it better. So that's, uh, it's kind of what's discussed in it. Um, the beginning of that discussion and then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going from there. So uh, enjoy this little clip. The, the, the truest power isn't the president. It's the people who convinced the country to vote for him. You know, the, the people who, are, who have this, this ability. And now this says here that it's, a, uh, that it's you know, is an important element of a democratic society. Propaganda is actually very necessary. Uh, think about... I mean, just think about anything that you need to make an informed decision on <laughs> or everything that we have to make informed decisions on what to eat, where to go to school, where to, you know, uh, stay when we go on, you know, go visit some other city. You know, all these things are there every day. You have to make decisions in your life. Now, the the best the best way to do it would be to do hours and hours of research on literally every uh, decision that you have to make. Nobody's got fucking time for that. 
So what you do is you just kind of defer to, you know, a uh, group think or what other, you know, you, you have trusted experts. Um, you go to Yelp reviews and see, oh, is this restaurant any good? Check out the Yelp reviews. You wait for, you want to get the, the informed consent and information that comes from everybody else. You look up reviews of the restaurant. You look up the, uh, you know, from, from professional reviewers. You see what everybody else is trying to say about it. And then you go from there. You make your decision. Am I going to go, you know, get burgers here? Or am I going to go get pizza from over there? Based on these and based on all of this information, but like honestly, how can you make these informed decisions without somebody, without having these other people who are already you know experiencing these things and putting forth their decision? And here's the thing, you know, when it comes to music, right? Uh, I could sit down and read a bunch of reviews about uh, music that you know, grunt, this is death metal, right? I don't fucking like death metal. But there are people out there who are informed and know things about death metal and have been following all this information. And, you know, if I had to have an opinion about death metal, I would go to somebody else. I would try to, you know, basically go, go by, by uh, an expert. And that's what that propaganda is. I mean, think about in, in this book, you know, he points out all of these different circulars, uh, which are, you know, like periodicals, newspapers, 1928, pre-internet. Uh, really, everybody has the uh, the ability to read at this point. Literacy rates are really high in America, and instead of like the internet, where we have you know, oh, I want to I want to do a message board for because I do RC racing, you know, uh, I'm going to go you know hang out you know on the internet and read things about RC racing. I want to go read things about guns. I want to go read things about weightlifting. Any of these things, you have all sorts of like you know you know weightlifting, uh, powerlifting, CrossFit keto, all these kinds of things that kind of break themselves down because we absolutely need that kind of thing. Hello, my dog is here now. Hello, Stella. Yes. Stella uh, does not have any information uh, about propaganda. She, however, does want me to give her dinner, I'm sure. But if she's up here, it means she's not downstairs barking. So I'm going to go ahead and give her uh, her loves here. But so when we talk about propaganda, as I said, one thing you have to understand, it's kind of vital. Because without giving it up to saying, I will trust the opinion of these people that are giving me information, you're never going to be able to make a decision on your own because you're never going to have the ability to make these, uh, these informed, you know, you, you can't go to every restaurant and try every dish uh, and then be able and then say, okay, well, I like this and I don't like that. You're never going to know until you actually go there and try it. Or you can you know, say, well, I, you know, I'll read this guy's review on it and uh, see, you know, if he likes it, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and do it. So propaganda is, is necessary for this, this, you know, push forward in, in, um, uh, uh, in our democracy, uh, in our abilities. And, and the fact that it really takes these people uh, who put forth this information and then us who repeats it, you know, we are not the creators of propaganda. We are the repeaters. We're the ones who take that information and keep push, pushing it out and uh, uh, propagating it and doing more and more. You know, it's it's absolutely insane. Um, and when you start reading more and more about the way propaganda works, and, you know, I'm going to be doing more uh, reading and writing on propaganda, but I really wanted to have this kind of like baseline thing to it um, before I did more information about it. So a couple of other things about propaganda. Hello, Stella. You want to say hello? A um, couple of other things about propaganda. Um, the way that propaganda works. Uh, I, I wish that I could tell you that, um, that, that, that the people who put out propaganda are benevolent or evil or whatever. Um, in, in a way of just like, you know, I'm going to put these things out for you to vote for Donald Trump, even though I don't believe these things myself. That's not true, because the easiest way for propaganda to work is for you to believe your own bullshit. Um, truly, without being able to believe, you know, you can't sell something unless you think that it's the greatest thing in the world. Or even if you don't think it's the greatest thing in the world, you still sell based on like, hey, it's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's affordable. Hey, it's not, you know, the most affordable thing, but it's higher quality than this, that and the other thing. You have to fully buy in and believe everything that you that you're putting forth, which is where I'm at now with what I try to do, um, where I'm trying to not have snap um, judgments on these things. On you know, just the thing that I read, 
the wombat thing. I got fully taken in by that pretty pretty quickly. Um, I didn't have any, you know, just like okay, yeah, sure, the, the wombat thing. They're they're putting their, uh, they're they're putting all these animals in their burrow. I didn't dig into it. Why? Because I don't know. Like even even me saying it sounded believable, it didn't. But it came from a Greenpeace source, and I was like, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. This is why these things are dangerous. And I'm not trying to say that you can't trust what people say, um, that you should just, you know, burrow in and try not, you know, no, you do have to visit every restaurant. You do have to try every dish to under to know whether or not you like it. But we do, as people, need to start understanding that propaganda is not necessarily going to be always benevolent. Uh, and whether or not they are, you know, somebody's trying to do it on purpose or not, the important thing is that we do our own due diligence and dig in a little bit before. Basically, I'm saying stop reacting to, head to headlines. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, as always, you can follow us. Uh, follow me at Army Strang. Follow Nate at In These Deserts. Follow us on uh, Twitter, on Facebook at Hell of a Way to Die dot com. Uh, the Patreon. If you are not a Patreon, uh, remember the ten dollar and up level gets you access to our uh, b b uh, our care package. Um, beginning of March, first of March, uh, that uh, new care package is going to go out. We've got new patches that are already on order. Uh, Nate has a killdozer uh that he is uh finishing up we're gonna get stickers made of that uh and then eventually a patch for that as well uh magnets all kinds of stuff ten dollar and up level for for that care package once every quarter but as always we've got our one our three and our five dollar levels and they all get you into the discord so uh please you know if you can um you know throw us a couple bones if not we always appreciate any support that you guys can give us um i'm always hearing about uh you know, soldiers who soldiers or or veterans and or, or just you know everyday people saying, yeah, I started listening and now I've got a friend listening and then I've got this person listening and so it's always uh, it's always nice to hear that we're that we're really reaching a lot of people. So uh, thank you for all that you do. And uh, as for the rest of it, Nate, we'll talk to you next week. Yep, have a good one. Zoom, zoom.